So moving along then in the next chapter of Deleuze, the, which is entitled Third Series of the Proposition. So uh, in this chapter he's going to talk about, uh, it's, going to do, it's, a, it's a particularly dense chapter and there's a lot going on in it, but one of the main goals of the chapter is to describe to you why he's writing a book about sense and not a book about truth. Uh, he's going to go to great lengths to, to, to display that, um, or to insist rather that sense is something very different from truth truth and falsity, uh, and that he's not interested in traditional theories of truth, he's interested in, in sense-making and how sense differs and, and represents an entirely separate category from all the traditional categories of logic um, hitherto. And so he starts off the chapter by saying then that, um, referring back to the previous discussion about the Stoics uh, deontologizing surface events from particular states of affairs of bodies, he says then, but there must be some relation between these surface events and language. There must be a fundamental relationship between them since uh, the events are expressible and they're normally expressible in the form of propositions about them. And so what he wants to know then is what is it then uh, about propositions? What, what are the relations of propositions and what are the different kinds of propositions? And he says that basically there turn out to be three different kinds of traditional propositions or three different categories of proposition. And then the first one is the category or the proposition, the type of proposition of denotation. And uh, in the category of denotation, the proposition of denotation, uh, we're concerned normally with statements of truth and falsity. Uh, this is the old correspondence adequatio theories of truth in which uh, truth is the agreement of the proposition with its objects or the agreement uh, between the language the, the, of the statement and that uh, reality or states of affairs between bodies that it reflects. And the, the accurate reflection determines the truth or falsity of the statement. And um, Deleuze puts it by saying that the denotation is filled when the words in it are filled with the, pro with the right images. If they're not filled with the right images, then the denotation is false. So this is a realm that has to do with particulars, not universals. This, this is the realm of, of particular things or material singularities, as he calls them or particulars, and it is not the relationship of the word to the general or the universal concept that determines truth. It's rather a statement of, of relations between particular entities, particular words, and their implications. So this is the type of proposition that has to do with a simple state, state of affairs. He doesn't give an example, but I presume that we could just say, you know, uh, the car ran over the cat or whatever. That, that's a simple statement of affairs that reflects a true event. It's very simple. It's a denotative statement. Then the next type of proposition, though, uh, is what he calls manifestation, those types of propositions which are a manifestation of the speaking subject himself. And so this, this type of proposition refers to the desires and beliefs of the I, the cogito, the individual ego that is uttering the proposition. And this is, of course, what he will later call in A Thousand Plateaus the subject of enunciation. Now, um, these different types of propositions should be, he imagines them as inside of a circle, but the way that he puts them, I like to imagine them as one inside of another, since denotations are made possible by manifestation, by statements made by a subject of enunciation who makes the statements. But the propositions that are manifestations of the desires and the beliefs of the I think are of a type that make possible denotative statements in the first place. And so the one makes the other possible, so we have manifestation. Now then there's a third order of propositions, and these are the propositions that he refers to as propositions of the type of signification or de uh, demonstration. Signification. Um, now signification... Um, just as manifestation through speech, not through language, but manifestation via speech makes possible denotation. Um, so likewise, signification, not through speech, but through language, makes possible manifestation, since the speaking subject operates out of a set of what we were calling before in the Derrida lectures, transcendental signifieds. These are the conditions that make truth possible in the first place the signifieds, the ultimate signifieds, the transcendental signifieds of God, world, the Heideggerian being idea, the logos idea. These are all the signifieds, and the signifieds themselves are the, the ultimate ideas within a metaphysical system that are ultimately anchored by transcendental signifieds as their ultimate terms. And those ultimate terms cannot be proven. They're simply assumed. Uh, God is 
not something that can be proven, although this was argued about, of course, by the scholastics. It's just simply assumed. Uh, either you assume that the world is infinite uh, in time or that it had a definite beginning. Uh, either you assume that space is infinite or that it has a definite boundary. You, you can't prove this in, the, in these antinomies. There is no proof. There's simply these metaphysical systems with transcendental signifieds that guarantee and make possible the utterances of the I, the very I that has desires and beliefs which are in turn guaranteed by these signifieds that make them possible. So the signifieds via language make manifestation, uh, propositions of the manifestation type possible just as those in turn make the denotative type of propositions possible. But of course, he says also that signified, uh, the realm of signification provides the transcendental a priori conditions of truth that make possible denotative statements as well. So those are also made possible by signifieds, and signifieds don't have anything else that make them possible, since they act as a sort of ultimate set of circularity in which we can say, for example, that if statement Z were true, uh, it's only true if we assume that premises A is true and B is true. If those two premises are true, then we can say that Z is true. But now we have just uttered a third premise, proposition C, which uh, will also need a proposition D that, that basically says that if Z is true, A, B, and C also will need to be true, and so on in an infinite regress. Uh, and this is just the way metaphysical systems work. They begin with ultimate concepts like God, the immortality of the soul, the cogito, the I that utters the manifestation, presupposes the cogito, the soul, the concept of a soul within a body, and all that, of course, although Deleuze doesn't talk about it, gets worked out by mythology and religion, which provide these transcendental signifieds or a priori that guarantee these other propositions and make them possible. Now, so what he wants to know, then, is there, there are three dimensions, then, to the propositions, to all the traditional propositions of philosophy, uh, truth and falsity, uh, the subject of enunciation, and the, the signifieds that make all of this possible in the first place, the a priori conditions that make them possible. Is sense part of this, it, or is sense something that is a fourth dimension uh, to these other three dimensions? And he's going to say, that indeed, yes, sense is something separate from these three. First, he says that sense is not the same thing as truth and falsity. So we can't identify it with denotation, since it's perfectly conceivable uh, that we can understand plenty of the, the sense of plenty of statements. Like you don't know, you know, say this, but you could say the moon is made of green cheese, and you understand the sense of that or nonsense of it. Uh, even though we know it's false, but its sense has nothing to do with its truth or its falsity. That's an entirely separate issue from understanding the sense of a denotative statement. So sense is not something that can be, even though whenever we make a denotative statement, we presuppose sense. We're already in sense, Deleuze says. Um, nonetheless, sense can't be reduced to it. So it's, it's different from denotative propositions. And then he says and we might have better success in identifying it with propositions of manifestation, but the problem with that is that propositions of manifestation presuppose a stable ego. And in an age in which there are transcendental signifieds that have slid from the stage and are gone, like God and world, and this happens to poor Alice, she, she loses all of her transcendental signifieds and they destabilize her sense of self, then sense becomes a very rubbery, slippery issue for an ego uh, that now has an unstable sense of self-identity. So we can't identify it with manifestation or with the subject of enunciation either. Can we identify it then with signification? It would seem to have better luck with signification, but not so here because signification is the set of conditions that make truth possible in the first place. That has nothing to do with the issue of sense. The transcendental a priori conditions do have a sense about them, but sense is not reducible to them. So the, the sense should should be a third, or rather a fourth dimension of truth, uh, not a type of proposition unto itself, but a, a different dimension of truth. Uh, of rather of, of propositions, another dimension of, of propositions. And he's going to say that it's the same thing, sense is the same thing as what he was talking about before, the Stoics' discovery of the event, of the surface events of things in which the Platonic ideas become identified with effects, and there are no causes, and we simply deal with language as the event. Language is propositions themselves utter uh, the expressible. So sense is what is expressed in a proposition itself. Um, the sense of events. Um, we can't say what is the sense of an event since an event already has sense in it whenever we express it in a statement. But we cannot, it's not the case either that sense, even though sense is attributable to a proposition, it's not just an attribute of a proposition. 
the way we can say that the tree is green. Greenness, would, in that case, would be a predicate, an, a predicate of the proposition, but it's also uh, a quality of the thing. But sense is attributable to the uh, proposition, but it's not the attribute, so it doesn't disappear into the proposition. It's, it's an attribute of the state of affairs that it's referring to, but it doesn't. It's not exhausted in the outer world either, in the, in the realm of the state of affairs either. It's not exhausted by that since. Uh, really, this sense is for him an event, it's a verb, and if we say, for example, that the tree greens, the greening, to green, is really the sense event that's involved near there, not the quality of greenness that the tree has as a property. Uh, the greenness is a property of it, but to green is a verb and is therefore an event that is in the proposition. So the proposition is always already expressing a sense event. So his ontology of events here is an ontology of propositions which, which act as a kind of hinge between states of affairs of bodies and the realm of language. It's, it's neither intelligible, sense is neither intelligible, uh, it, it's not reducible to language since it has one foot in both worlds. It refers both to the exterior world of the state of things uh, and contingent states of affairs between bodies as well as referring to the inner state of language. It's a kind of hinge like Derrida's uh, la brisure, it's a kind of hinge that connects the interior world with the exterior world at the boundary, the liminal zone where they form together, which is of course the flat world of the cards that appear in Alice in Wonderland, the world of, 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 of surfaces. These are surface of effects and sense is the boundary making world by means of which the mind makes sense out of things via language and propositions. But these are Propositions, these sense effects, uh, these sense events rather of these effects as propositions are decorporealized. They're incorporealized. They're not in things. So sense is something that is, that is very different from truth. It's very different from bodies, and it's very different from propositions. It's, it can't be. It's an irreducible property unto itself that can't be reduced to any of these other categories. So he's gone to great lengths then in this chapter to separate out the concept of sense, what he means by sense from all of these other traditional philosophical ideas uh, because he wants to demonstrate that what Lewis Carroll is doing in the Alice novels is excavating sense, not truth and falsity, but, but sense and nonsense and how and what they mean and signify.